there are three other Greek words also used for sin in the New Testament. Another one is paraptoma. Paraptoma. It's used, for example, in Romans 4.25 and so on. You have the scriptures there. And it's usually translated as trespass. It means, however literally, a kind of careless, unpremeditated fault. And this emphasizes the thoughtless, careless nature of sin. It doesn't mean to say that people don't exactly know what they're doing, but they don't really care what they're doing. And so the picture here is of somebody who uh, sees a shortcut through your garden and just tramples on your flowers and walks straight through on the other side to greet their friend. They say it doesn't matter what they're doing. I suppose they, they know what they're doing. They're aware of it really, but they don't care. They, they're so careless about it, they don't even notice what they're doing. That's the idea behind this word for sin, paraptoma. And so it emphasizes the thoughtless, careless nature of sin. Then we have another word, parabasis. And uh, this means, quite literally, a stepping aside. It's a deliberate deviation from the true path. Here we have the true path, and we step aside from the true path in a deliberate way, a deliberate deviation from that which is right. It's often translated transgression. And this word emphasizes the willful deliberate side of sin, as well as that I couldn't care less attitude about sin, there is also the deliberate defiant aspect of sin which says, I am going to go my own way even if God says something else. Now another word, anomia, which literally means lawlessness. All the scripture references that go with these words, you can see them for yourself there in the manual. It literally means lawlessness or iniquity. And it refers to the opposite of what is right and good. If there's something right and good, then this is the opposite of it. So anomia means literally without law or against law or lawless, lawless. And the law here stands for everything that is right and good. And this aspect of sin shows that we line up in the exact opposite direction when it comes to the good things of God and to his righteous requirements for our lives. That's the description of our lives as sinners. But thank God we are no longer sinners. We are in Christ Jesus. So these words convey to us uh, the idea of, of failing to match God's perfect standards. They describe the, the deeds and attitudes that separate us from each other and from God. And although these words are largely synonymous their different shades of meaning help us grasp the full and complex and subtle nature of sin. Now, thank God we're delivered from it. You see, this deliverance comes to us from forgiveness or through forgiveness. And I want to speak to you about initial forgiveness and ongoing forgiveness. Now, believe me, I'm laying a very important foundation for the deliver deliverance ministry. Now, after many years of experience in this area, let me tell you, you will not regret spending time going through this, both for yourself and the people that you will be ministering to. Now, the Bible promises forgiveness from all aspects of sin. This is good news. The Bible promises forgiveness from hamartia, which is in Colossians 1.14. Hamartia in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And if you remember, hamartia stresses very particularly, hamartia stresses this irresistible inner moral power, that drawing away to, towards sin, drawing away from God. And so when we receive forgiveness, it is a deliverance. That's what Colossians 1.14 is speaking about, in whom we have redemption. Redemption is a word for deliverance. It means being set free. We have redemption, deliverance through his blood. Notice it's the blood that sets us free. And here the forgiveness of sins is talking about being released from hamartia, which is that inner compulsion to sin. 